to thank you all for joining us for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Healthy Housing State Policies, brought to you by the NCSL Environmental Health Program. The, uh, my name is Doug Farquhar, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today we have uh, a couple of guests uh, with us. Um, we have Tom Neltner, who is a Special Advisor on Regulatory Affairs with the National Center for Healthy Housing, and Tom has a long history working on healthy housing issues, and he has been uh, he has been involved with this issue for and code work for the past several years, um, and joining uh, National Center for Healthy Housing in 2014 after serving as the Director of Training and Education. Um, from 2005 to 2010. So it's great to have Tom back with us in the healthy housing world. As for myself, I will be the other person speaking. Uh, we are, uh, I uh, direct the environmental health program here at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and we are involved with several issues, including the issue of healthy housing, and we're very, very pleased to be able to update our healthy housing pages and revise a lot of our work we've been doing on healthy housing so the states and state policymakers can begin to review this issue and get a, gain a better understanding of what is involved when uh, we are discussing the issue of healthy housing. Um, private residential housing, where most people spend their time, has few requirements designed to protect the health of the people living there. But through a mix of state and local construction requirements, housing policy, building codes, and consumer rights, certain jurisdictions do provide some level of protection. But we have found no state with a single comprehensive uh, healthy housing law on its books. With that in mind, we are going to discuss today how this country addresses healthy housing with a review of state, federal, and local housing policies and learn along with an introduction to healthy housing standards that will be provided by Tom. Before we begin, I would like to mention that our presenters will be answering questions after their presentations. Um, please, be, uh, please type in your questions at the question box on the right side of your screen at any time during the webinar, and I will present those questions to the uh, speaker, either myself or to Tom. Or, um, and, and we may have HUD on the line as well. We are also interested in hearing comments on what information you uh, may need or want to know to better as, uh, address um, issues regarding healthy housing. The webinar and presentation slides will be recorded and will be posted on the NCSL website. You will receive a notice shortly to discuss how to link to those resources. With that, I'm going to uh, make a request to see if Marty Nee has joined us from HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. Marty, are you with us today? I'm going to take that as Marty wasn't able to attend this afternoon, but I know several folks from HUD are uh, listening in and uh, will be, uh, will be um, able to provide any sort of insight for us later on if we have questions regarding from HUD. With that, I'd like to um, begin this uh, session. Um, this is a, a session on healthy housing and state policies. The first question is, why should we focus on housing as a health issue? Well, inadequate housing has long been linked to adverse health and safety issues. Um, millions of children live in environments that are unhealthy. And studies in pretty previous centuries, we have looked at um, seeing that how poor housing conditions adversely affect people's health. Um, this has come down and has led to a comprehensive approach to dealing with health and housing and the threats from that housing may provide to the people living there. A, um, uh, this has been mostly seen in the term of sanitary codes, um, different safe housing codes, safe street cleaning requirements, drainage, sewage, ventilation, all these efforts that we have seen uh, over the past hundred years to make housing and buildings safer all are indirectly related to the health of the occupants in those homes. 
But for the way this country has addressed housing regulation has not been a very top-down approach. It has been very much an up from the bottom. The first places we have seen healthy or housing requirements have been from the uh, state and local level, and with the That's federal like government the, coming in later. Um, so like the first for just a second, your your PowerPoint's not advancing on the slide on the screen. It's not. It's not. Um, did that make any difference? Now it did, yes. OK. Um, regulating housing, um, as, I, as I was mentioning, um, I'm going to have to go back a slide here. And oops, I'm sorry, one more time. Um, regulating housing, federal response, and hopefully you can all see that right now. Um, as I was mentioning, this has been a top, uh, bottom up approach. The first codes we saw were uh, regarding fire safety and was it, were adopted in certain cities that were trying to uh, make sure that uh, the buildings were built without any, uh, that was going to prevent any fires from occurring. And uh, we've seen those mostly enforced when adopted by a state and local police powers. Um, the federal government does have a role and has gained a role over the past 50 uh, years or so by addressing certain issues. Of course, housing, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, they uh, control and oversee um, federally sponsored housing. The Department of Defense oversees uh, housing on military bases. Um, products, if they are unhealthy, there are some regulations with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. EPA has requirements on lead hazards and asbestos and has guidance available on radon and mold, but there is no federal housing or federal building code that's applicable to the entire country. In response, essentially what happens is we have housing and building codes, and they are, as I stated, either state or locally enforced, privately enforced by the insurance or mortgage markets, and they're really addressed on a haphazard way. There's not a universal standard that they've been adopted in certain states. There's a statewide code which um, is, uh, 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 governs all housing within the state. Other states, such as Arizona, they have no statewide code. Rather, they have a series of local codes which, um, which determine housing. Um, Many cities have some sort of code. Um, most, if not all, municipalities have adopted some building code or standards that builders must follow. City use, uh, cities use building inspectors to make sure the codes have been followed, that the structures are sound. But in several parts of this country, there are no codes. In uh, rural jurisdictions, in uh, several uh, areas outside um, the cities that we, we may not have codes, or the codes may not be enforced all that rigidly. So you, get, uh, you have a great deal of gaps and a great deal of uh, uh, changes and amendments and moderations to the various codes in this, across the country. Um, when we regulate housing, as I mentioned, there's no Organic Housing Act. There's no model state law um, outside the Uniform uh, Residential Landlord-Tenant Act uh, that, that is, uh, that's applicable to all residential housing or buildings. And there's really no quick legislative fix on this. Um, but for the most part, housing is regulated by the state, or excuse me, by the uh, individual building codes. Um, the reason for this is because we are regulating an unregulated community. Uh, these, uh, when you deal with private housing, you do not have, you're not subject to um, uh, uh, HUD requirements. You are not subject to um, occupational health and safety requirements because unless there's an employee-employer relationship, um, uh, it's uh, outside the jurisdiction of many federal requirements. So the point being is that this is a state and local issue. 
Um, I'm going to skip past this slide and go on to the next one to kind of just give a quick overview of residential building codes. Um, this uh, arguably is not all the codes that are identified out there that could be identified. These are the ones that are coming down uh, for the most part from the International Code Council which uh, for the which which handles most codes um, in this country. And what I mean by that is that they come together and they design and they adopt codes for different various issues. And as you can see here, it goes everywhere from the International Building Code, um, uh, fuel gas codes, uh, residential codes, property maintenance codes, uh, green building standards, but not one code will encompass all these issues. It's really up to the various jurisdictions to go in and determine which codes should be applicable in their jurisdiction and to which properties. And a code is not enforceable unless a state or local government adopts it. That means that, um, and, uh, uh, that a code in and of itself is not enforceable. It's got to be, it has to have the provisions of a uh, the state's police power or a local police power to make it go into effect. Now as you can see here, codes have been developed for residential, property maintenance, fire, electrical, plumbing, for green building standards, which is fairly recent. And now we have a healthy housing standard thanks to uh, the good work of uh, Tom and the National Center for Healthy Housing. Um, just real briefly, I wanted to mention about the Universal uh, Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act. That is something that will apply in a landlord tenant situation. It doesn't apply to all homes, but it's something I did want to highlight. It has been adopted in half the states. Uh, another few states have adopted a warranty of habitability, which means that if you do rent the house, it has to be habitable. Um, another 15 states have some sort of provisions out there that relate to landlord tenant. Um, and really, only one state, North Dakota, has that, that's out there that has no landlord tenant law at this point. So that's about the closest thing we've been able to find to a residential um, housing uh, maintenance standard that is going to be applicable. Now for um, a code to be adopted, um, every state has a, their own unique way of doing it. Now these states in dark blue, if, a, uh, if the um, state building code uh, council adopts a certain code, it's applicable across the state. And that's what we were talking about earlier, where states such as New Jersey, North Carolina, much of the Midwest, uh, uh, New England, Minnesota, these are states that have an agency that is in charge of adopting and enforcing building codes. In the states where, uh, that are light blue, you do have a state code, but local provisions can apply and they can override the, um, not so much override, but they can be more stringent than the state code. So there is some, uh, there is some mo uh, uh, understanding of a state standard in rural areas, but the local uh, jurisdictions can come up with more stringent standards. Um, purple, that is where you have local control. You do not have a state code there. You have, uh, but you will have local jurisdictions able to come forward with their own um, code provisions and make those applicable for in their areas. Finally, it's the states in red that we may be most focused on because th those are the states where when either the agency or somebody adopts a code for the state, that code provisions have to go back through the legislature and the legislature has to ultimately adopt those code provisions to uh, say that this is going to be applicable for this state. So um, uh, uh, when it comes to a certain housing standards or healthy housing standards, um, there's going to be many variety of ways for states to adopt these provisions, either uh, uh, from a state agency, from a legislative process, or from a local, uh, uh, from, from local control. Um, have states gone beyond uh, the codes? Yes. Um, there are several provisions in the codes that have been, uh, uh, that either have been 
uh, not adopted or that um, they don't, uh, they have been applicable in that jurisdiction. So states, and what I mean by states, I really mean state legislatures, have come in and adopted and have gone beyond the code council. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors is a very good example where we're seeing 29 states requiring detectors in some sort of, of uh, building, whether it's schools or in homes. Um, 11 states require radon resistant new construction where a, a building cannot be built unless it's built to certain uh, radon uh, mitigation standards. We have nine states out there that have laws addressing health threats from molds, which is well beyond any sort of um, any sort of requirement from the federal government. Uh, two states have formaldehyde requirements that deal with indoor air quality. Many states have laws addressing stoves, heaters, fireplaces, and chimneys, and and uh, we have five states that deal with mercury in their homes. Um, examples of bed bugs. They're regulated in many uh, statutes. So states can go beyond the, the healthy housing requirements within codes. Um, finally, I'd like to identify that we are having a, a uh, we have updated our state healthy housing laws and that um, that's going to be available or that is available at ncsl.org at go19836. Um, we also have updated our pages on state building codes, which is available at go25252. Um, or if you want to find out if any states have come forward with um, environment, uh, with healthy housing legislation, we are going to be tracking that this year. And you can get that from our environmental legislative database at ncsl.org, go 17322. And with that, I will take, if anybody has any immediate questions, um, right now I will be glad to bring that up. Um, it, it looks like we uh, only have a few questions, which might be mostly answered by uh, Tom's presentation. So I think I'm going to move it on right now and, and go over to Tom. Um, but if you, just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available um, at the NCSL website. With that, I would like to turn it over to Tom. Tom Neltner. I think, thanks, Doug. I appreciate uh, the introduction to the issue from a state perspective. Um, and it's clear that housing is local. And it's, it's managed at a local level. We've talked, always talked about 50 laboratories, the state being 50 laboratories. Well, we probably have 450 laboratories for housing because communities take responsibility for their own housing through codes and other means. So what I want to do is step back and look at what was proposed last May in the National Healthy Housing Standard. Back in 1986, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Public Housing Authority came out with their housing code. And what we did is work with Centers for Disease Control and the American Public Health, uh, Public Health Association and updated that and called it the National Healthy Housing Standard. It's really about public health. And we launched that standard on May 16th at the National Press Club. There were 50 partners there. Uh, a former and current Hazard HUD secretaries were there. Um, corporate advisory members and several housing intermediaries were there, and the trade press, press. In other words, it was a big rollout of this update from almost 20 years ago of this standard. Now, Doug talked about all these other model standards, the International Code Council. Those have a different purpose, and this one is it, the purpose is healthy housing. It is not the same as those other ones because it isn't an industry consensus standard. What it is is it's based on the science. And it is one that we anticipate people using as a menu of options, an a la carte menu to pick from to see what they think, what provisions are important in their community. You could move to the next slide, please. And so one person that made the presentation was Henry Cisneros. Um, he said the standard will inspire action and cross-sector collaboration at all levels of government and the private sector. 
and it's going to save lives, shrink the disparities uh, that we see in housing, and try to make sure that our homes are safe havens as they are meant to be. We also had um, Sean Donovan when he was still the uh, HUD, um, HUD secretary there. If you could go to the next slide. It always takes a while to catch up here. And he said the standard gets us closer to the goal of having a safe and affordable housing for every American, and that HUD's going to look at it with respect to its own operations. And in fact, HUD is looking at it. The Office of Healthy Homes and Lead Hazard Control has asked for a comparison of this to both their housing quality standards that apply to Section 8 voucher property, as well as the Uniform Physical Condition Standards, UPCS, that's applied to other subsidized housing. If we can move to the next slide, we can look a little more deeply at what is the National Healthy Housing Standard. It's not just pure public health. If it was pure public health, we'd probably price it out of the range for affordable housing. But from our perspective, if a, if a change is not affordable, if it's not attainable, enforceable, practical, it's not very effective. So we attempted to balance the two. Other programs may balance it a little differently, but with NCHH, National Center for Healthy Housing, and the American Public Health Association, this is how we reach that balance between health and achievability, attainability. If you can move to the next slide. So here we look at, it's, it is a standard, it could conceivably be adopted in whole, but frankly, it's something that's designed to be looked at at pieces. And so we try to package it up so people can say, oh, well, this provision on lead is important, or I'm really interested in how it makes access to noise, or it deals with noise, or uh, artificial lighting. So it's designed to give people code language that they could refer to when they're interested in a particular provision. And as part of that, we're evaluating and comparing the National Healthy Housing Standard to many local codes, as well as to other model codes so communities understand what the options are and how you can pick it. It's the idea, part of it is to show the disparity between some of those current model codes and what you would really look at for a healthy home. Uh, we know affordable housing partners are always committed to making sure their homes are as healthy as possible. So they're looking at adopting it in some of their green standards and um, a lot of tech providing technical assistance. It's a way for cities to look at um, a, an a la carte menu again before they can adopt in their code. We can move to the next slide. So there are seven sections, topics in it. So this gives you an idea of what's in there. One is duties of owners and occupants. Most of the codes don't do well with who does what. The Uniform Landlord-Tenant Act, which has been adopted in 49 states and with some variation, makes that clear, but it doesn't overlap with the property maintenance code and who is responsible for sanitation. So there's a disconnect. So we tried to bring together what's in the landlord-tenant law with what's in property maintenance and set some clear standards. The other one is structure, facilities, plumbing, and space. These are pretty much your go-to things. So we want to make sure the house is standing. We want to make sure that holes aren't on the floor. We want to make sure the plumbing works. We want to make sure that there's basic room for people to have privacy and space to live. The third area is safety and personal security. Um, that's making sure that there's locks on the doors. Some of it's pretty basic. Other ones are making sure that when there's a new tenancy, you get a new lock. You don't have to share a key with a prior, prior tenant. Other ones deal with personal security, which get a lot into lighting, so making sure that uh, areas are well lit, um, that there's guards on screens so people can't access the wind to open a window, those kinds of areas. Next one is lighting and electrical systems. Um, lighting and electrical systems will deal with making sure that there's ground fault circuit interrupts on, on the kitchen ones or wherever there's water, um, making sure there's adequate lighting so people are comfortable there, making sure there's natural lighting. Uh, many of those first, those three provisions, uh, the two, three, and four, are very common in housing codes. What we've done is tried to bring in the latest science on health and safety. The next one is on thermal comfort ventilation and energy efficiency. A lot of these local codes and some of the model codes 
still deal well with that um, issue, which is, is the furnace working and is it going to maintain a sufficient heat? We see so many codes trying to deal with that, but another one is ventilation. And more importantly, how do you isolate the garage where there may be gasoline being stored out there, carbon monoxide from a, uh, from a car that may be warming up? How do you make sure that doesn't get into the house? And then, of course, energy efficiency. Another area that some of the codes struggle on is moisture control, solid waste, and pest management. So we've got some provisions in there bringing in the latest science on moisture control, air sealing, um, ventilation exhaust out of kitchens um, and bathrooms and the like. And the last one is one that most codes, most state and local codes don't deal with much at all, and that's chemical and radiological agents. Uh, lead, radon, asbestos, um, cleaning up after methamphetamine would be an example. If you go to the next slide, you get some examples of what's in the National Healthy Housing Standard. Oh, well, this one's describing that we do have two types of provisions in the standard. One is what we call as essential or mandatory provisions. There's 157 of those, and there's 52 of the stretch. The stretch provisions are what you'd look at as things you'd want to do if you're building a new house or doing a major rehab. Um, they're, they're goals for a total of 209 provisions. That's a lot to even have on an a la carte menu. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the, the areas that we don't find traditionally a fit into most housing codes, although many communities have adopted pieces of it. One is noise. Now, the connection between noise and health is clear in some areas, especially welfare. But if a person is it's too loud, a person is not comfortable in their own housing, it's going to be very disruptive to their health. It has lots of other implications. So we tried to set some standards on how you measure noise and what you would say would be too much. A difficult issue uh, is one that HUD is wrestling with and taken on is smoking in multifamily housing. Since most air in one unit goes into another unit, if you have one unit with a smoker, it's going to be sharing it with others. So there's secondhand smoke through the ventilation system, through the connections that you have in multifamily housing. So it's trying to set a policy where you're fair to the existing residents, but you can set a policy to try to uh, reduce the smoking for those who are not smoking so they have some protection. Fire extinguishers. Most housing codes don't call for fire extinguishers in housing. Yet, um, the National Fire Protection Association says all homes should have one. Similarly, carbon monoxide alarms. Um, in many of the model codes didn't until 2012, the nation's model codes for fire and property maintenance didn't call for carbon monoxide alarms. But states filled the gap, just as they always have where the model codes aren't keeping up. So that's an example that's not in most codes, although many states have filled the gap. Lead. This is lead-based paint primarily. Um, lead-based paint is that's been adopted at state and local levels on a on a varying one. We propose sort of some common standards that people can look at. Asbestos again, it's um, it does affect. There is national standards for if it's four units or more in a in an apartment multifamily dwelling, but some communities have adopted it. Doug gave you some of the basic numbers. Similarly with radon, one that is new is methamphetamine, which is we're not trying to say how you make methamphetamine in a house, that would be illegal. What we're saying is, is how do you make sure the people who follow a home that's had methamphetamine laboratories in it, how do you make sure that it's safe? So we've tried to set some standards for that and pushed some model standards because um, the chemicals that are used there are pretty harsh. Finally, there's pesticides. All states regulate pesticides, but they do it separately from housing codes. So we have tried to bring in a, more of a way to integrate those two. If you could go to the next slide, there's another way to look at this. And that is, where were we trying to make it clear that they're typically addressed in housing codes, but not clear responsibilities? And it's where we see a lot of arguments and disputes going on. One is, who's responsible for what? Um, if there's a pest problem, who's responsible for it? Is there a duty to cooperate? So we've tried to clarify some of those responsibilities. The other one is moisture control. In other words, when who, you know, how do you make sure that you don't have water damage in the house? Who gets who to report it when you do find it? Ventilation is another one. Um, 
many of them call for well ventilated or a bathroom window. But the reality is a lot of bathrooms, even if they have a window, people aren't comfortable opening it. Um, they want to keep it closed to, to save them energy, uh, air conditioning, and heating. So there's the issue of ventilation in there. Another one is air sealing. How do you make sure that the air in your garage is not coming into the house with all the contamination that could be in there? Or how do you make sure that the doors aren't leaking air outside in with all the moisture or the cooling that's in there? So it's trying to make sure that the air, is, the air in the home is breathing properly. The final area we find code struggling on is pest management. None of them advocate for more pets. They all call for its elimination. But it's not clear what the pest is. How do you deal with those pests when you find them? Some of them, including the nation's model codes until 2009, said you should just do extermination, spray, and fumigate. Well, those aren't particularly effective methods when we see cockroaches, for example. Fogging for cockroaches is effectively just harvesting the adults because it doesn't get to the young ones that are behind the walls. So rather than harvest the adults only to have to be called 15 days later into the next round, it's trying to, how do you, trying to use integrated pest management to eliminate those pests. The next slide gives another way to look at this. And I apologize, this one's busy. But when we look at this, we have to be clear that the National Healthy Housing Standard is not a construction or rehab standard. There are very good ones by the International Code Council on that. What it is is focusing on all aspects, construction, rehab, maintenance, and management. So it can be used to strengthen the existing code. You could adopt it in the ent entirety. It could overlay with the existing International Property Maintenance Code, and I'll show you a slide on that next. It could deal with landlord-tenant law and how what's the responsibilities of the landlord and the tenant. It could also be um, a standard expectation of homeowners and landlords of what their mutual expectations are for um, each other or how the house should be built or for buyers um, and sellers. So you can go to the next slide. So this is trying to look at what Doug was talking about or the relationship between federal, state, and local in a slightly different way. Um, as Doug said, it's not a finely tuned machine with everything perfectly integrated. But the biggest cog in this wheel to protect residents in housing is local codes. State codes also play a role, in this, and so does federal. And the federal tends to work through the state codes. So if you think of it this way, it may be a way to better understanding. At the federal level, they really do three things. One is they adopt product standards. What is an acceptable lawnmower? What is an acceptable furnace? Consumer Product Safety Commission set standards for that. Um, EPA set standards for wood-burning stoves and you know, limits asbestos in some materials. So there are product standards that EPA and the Consumer Product Safety Commission do. And in fact, HUD does. But HUD does it for manufactured housing. So when you buy a manufactured home, HUD sets product standards for that. The other type are service standards. In other words, to a consumer, when you buy this service, what do you have to do? What should you do to make sure it's being done safely? And the model for that is EPA's lead safety program. They say when you're disturbing paint in a pre-1978 how a target housing, you need to have a certified renovator to make sure it's done safely. So it's really designed to protect the buyer from contractors to make sure that they're doing it right. It doesn't tell homeowners how they have to do the work inside their own home. It's more for when you buy services. The final way is housing codes. And HUD says, when you're taking our money, when you're using our money, we want to make sure that it's being used in a home that's safe for the residents. So they have two primary ones, the housing quality standards, which apply to Section 8 vouchers, and for all other properties, the uniform physical condition standards. Those are effectively housing codes, but for that very narrow slice of federally subsidized housing. In contrast to states, landlord-tenant law often is defined at the state level, although the locals can do more variations on it. But a lot of it is looked at the state level, and that's the Uniform Residential Landlord-Tenant Law. 
We also have the construction code, although some states don't do those, as Doug just covered. Most of those are from the International Code Council. Um, that's where you get your building code, your fire code, your residential code, um, your existing building code. And then there's the critical role for states, filling gaps. Best examples where they're filling gaps where the federal government was late to ask, uh, respond or the International Code Council was late to respond, and that is carbon monoxide alarms, lead, the lead-based paint standards, radon. Um, you'll see other ones, and, and Doug had reviewed those. So filling the gaps where the federal hasn't yet acted or the model codes are slow to act. The other way is setting minimum housing standards. Michigan does this. Tennessee, Massachusetts, uh, California. Some states are a little surprising where they do set some standards of what they say everybody has to have this. Um, those are not consistent. When it comes to housing codes, it's mostly local. <coughs> and most of the housing codes are not in rural areas. Most counties, most locals have adopted those construction codes, the International Code Council, because they want to make sure that there is some, that houses are at least building, being built right. And what they typically do there is they adopt the code and they remove the things they don't want. Like sometimes it's permitting, other times they, uh, they don't want uh, some provisions to go into effect. <coughs> so where you have a lot of rental housing, you typically have the housing code. Excuse me, getting a drink here. And the housing codes are all primarily going focused on rental housing. And through all of this, you have permitting, compliance, and enforcement. That is almost entirely a local issue. <coughs> so the next slide, please. So where does it fit into the model codes? Well, the property maintenance code is the biggest one. Um, it could also be in the construction codes. But the property maintenance applies to all existing housing, and it's been adopted by mm, probably several hundred localities probably not the most popular of one because the people who adopt it, the code officials, think in terms of construction, whereas the property maintenance is what you do when you're not doing construction. But also, the uh, National Healthy Housing Standards have been adopted or being considered provisions of it are being incorporated into the affordable housing standards by Enterprise and NeighborWorks. I know LEED is looking at it as well. And again, HUD is looking at upgrading their standards to look at the provisions of the National Healthy Housing Standards. So now we go to the tough slide. That's the next one. This one's busy. But I wanted to show you sort of how, if you said the National Healthy Housing stretch provisions, the mandatory and the stretch combined, that's 100%, you can see that the green bar is those standards that are we consider in the National Healthy Housing Standards as mandatory. So you think of the stretch and the mandatory as best just the mandatory is better, we wanted to show how it varies from what is often the nation's default code, housing code, the International Property Maintenance Code, which is a good standard. But you can see it's short on all the area. It does pretty well on the first three, on structures and per safety and lighting. It falls short on the ventilation, as I mentioned before. It's behind the times on that, often because it's a consensus standard. and um, and through the consensus process, there are some stakeholders that aren't comfortable with spending the money to make sure the home is well ventilated or uh, is, is comfortable. The other one it falls short on is moisture control, solid waste, and pest management, primarily the pest management provisions. And what you'll see is the biggest gap is when it deals with chemical and radiological agents. And, and frankly, the property maintenance code just is, is really weak on that, um, partly because it's based, uh, they really think in terms of safeties, where they're thinking in terms of injuries, fall prevention, not so much on those health problems like radon, asbestos, or lead. So we can get more details on that, but let's, the next slide will be more helpful for us um, in sort of telling you what we're working on. Okay, so there we just submitted the National Center for Healthy Housing. For, it's five proposals, but there's two on the first one. 
that deal with calling for carbon monoxide alarms in all dwellings. Right now they're required in multifamily housing and only in one and two family homes when there's a permit issue. The trick is, is the homes that are most at risk for carbon monoxide are the ones that are not going to have a permit issue, where they've got the oldest appliances, where they don't, aren't making the investment in safety, uh, where the home is, is struggling. And in those cases, we're saying it should be incorporated into the property maintenance code that all people benefit from carbon monoxide alarms. While it sounds expansive, it's not because so many states have filled the gap where the International Code Council was slow to adopt in 2012 these standards. The second one is really what I think of as a good government one. And it says when, when, the, when the community is issuing a permit for rehab in multifamily housing, they should make sure that the property owner has submitted certifications that there's, there's a let's say certified renovation firm doing the work. Those would only apply to pre-1978 housing. Um, but the idea being that it's a teachable moment. Rather than a gotcha where EPA comes in afterwards or the state comes in afterwards and says you didn't comply with the law, let's try to have that reminder that there needs to be certified renovation firms up front. In the next round on the residential code, we plan on proposing that before. Now understand, that this one's a tough haul. The, the carbon monoxide alarms and the renovation firms were rejected in the last round before these code committees. Um, and we tried to work with the groups. I think the home building industry and renovation industry are a lot more comfortable with this proposal because we've narrowed it and focused it. Um, but I, I understand that they may still be very concerned about carbon monoxide alarms. The other one is improving pest elimination and adopting IPM. There were some odd provisions in it because it, these code officials don't know, getting into homes and dealing with pest control is not their main area, but it is in the pest management, uh, in the pest property maintenance standards. So, for example, it says uh, eliminate all insects, indoors and outdoors. Well, eliminating crickets and honeybees outdoors is not a good idea. So we tried to refine the language to talk about the noxious pests and to uh, say communities that want can adopt an integrated pest management program and we provide a language for that. The last one is a little tricky. What we do is establish the health standards for radon, asbestos, and lead-based paint that are typically these are federal standards. And we put them in an optional appendix that a community who wants to adopt them can. And the way it works in this, in this proposal is very narrow. It would say that a health department who finds a problem often is struggling with how it doesn't have the means to require that in a home, yet the property maintenance code can. So it says to a community, when you want your code officials and you want your health departments to work together, here's how they do it. Adopt this provision so you've got some language that's been vetted by the code council to make that happen. So let's go to the next slide and, and talk a little bit broadly as we wrap up here. So what's the outcome of all this? Well, we only adopted this in May. Um, we're evaluating 15 communities to compare how they do with how their local code fares against the property maintenance code. Actually, I just did one solicitation, and I have 32 communities um, representing probably 10% of all Americans. I have already asked us to do this evaluation. So we know there's a lot of interest in communities in upgrading their code. And we hope that the, they will look at the standard and we'll help them, um, give them some technical assistance to help them adopt it. So let's go to the next one. And ultimately, you can see the standards when we send out the follow-up email. We'll send you links to how you find the healthy housing standard. I love the way it broke that H up there. But that's all one word. But we'll send you the link there. You've got my emails as well as our uh, acting executive director, Jonathan Wilson. And we'll send you a link that provides you with the copies of our proposals that we submitted to the Code Council. We want to leave 15 minutes, and we are right on time to handle questions and um, be able to provide answers for you as best we can. Doug? Yes, Tom, thank you very much. That was very informative. We have several questions, actually, and that is wonderful to hear. I'm going to try to get through them uh, chronologically. Uh, the first one is, how are states getting the National Healthy Hazard Healthy housing standard adopted. 
um, they were m noting that in their state, enacting legislation to be adopted across all municipalities will be extremely difficult. Well, that's going to be state by state. It's a 50 laboratories or thousands when you start talking communities. I, I know some states are looking at it now. I think it's going to be a lot more of education than straight state adoption because there aren't a lot of straight state healthy housing codes. I think it's a lot of local adoption, showing it works at the local level and seeing how it moves forward. So what you could do at the state level is educate local. Um, I think there is a, a way, one option that you could do in the code count, when, in legislation, and we're talking NCSL here, is uh, uh, the state legislature could say, please consider or authorize the adoption of provisions should they want into their property maintenance code or their own housing code. Uh, but it's still up for discussion. And we have 50 laboratories, and we want to work with all the communities that are interested. Okay. And to add on to that, Tom, uh, one thing we have noticed out there is um, usually the uh, uh, first communities or the brave communities that have a challenge with it, uh, as I tell most people, state legislatures want to be number 25. They don't want to be number one. They don't want to be number 50. They want to be right in the middle of the pack. So after we see a few states adopting these standards and seeing how well they work, then I think that will encourage others to start coming on board. And if we have other incentives out there for folks to look at this, um, I think we will start seeing a, a better a better return. But at this point, it's very much in its infancy, and so that's going to be very difficult to um, find that first state that's going to uh, going to adopt or the first it municipality. Be, and it may be just another way to look at it is, why, what's the problem with just doing lead standards or mold standards or asbestos standards? And why not, what's the advantage of thinking of them in an integrated manner? Well, they're all, the problems are all tied together. If you've got rats, you probably have cockroaches. And if you've got rats and cockroaches, you probably have water damage, which is all along with that comes mice. And with that comes the mold, and with that comes asthma. So you, you have to understand that many of these problems all come together. And the, if we built this around the basic principles of keeping a home ventilated, keeping it dry, keeping it safe, keeping it um, comfortable, keeping it pest free. And so what we try to do is you have to think of a home as an integrated piece that dealing with moisture has a tremendous impact both on the comfort, the integrity of the home, because it's not going to be rotting, but also the health of the residents via the mold or the pests that are attracted by the moisture, and therefore you're talking asthma. And it's a lot of the deteriorated paint that we see on land actually comes from the, uh, the moisture damage as well. So it tries to approach things in holistic rather than a, a whack-a-mole approach that we sometimes see with uh, one by one standards that are out there. Tom, uh, I'd like to move on to the next question. We have several questions here regarding lead, certifi lead certified firms and uh, questions such as, um, is this a major problem in pre-78 homes? Would it make more sense to adopt it only for pre-1960 or 1950 homes? Um, what are some of your thoughts regarding lead certified and uh, lead based paint provisions? Well. It is a federal standard. EPA adopted it um, for tar target housing, which really means anything but zero bedroom dwellings uh, 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 in efficiency, and for child occupied facilities. And they wrestled with the issue of should it be pre-1960 or pre-1978. And what they found is that there was enough evidence that lead was on the homes built between 1960 and 1978 that it was important to cover these homes. Much of that lead is on the outside of homes rather than on the inside, but it's still present on the inside. Um, and obviously it gets better as soon as you, as you approach 1978 when it really became phased out of the paint. So there is no bright line. I think, frankly, 1960 is not that much of a bright line either. So uh, it's important to use 1978. It's also important because the federal law requires it. 
Now, here's our approach on this: is rather than have EPA do uh, have to swoop in or the state to come in and look at the records and catch people violating the law, which is what they're often left with, they've tried to educate people. But there's no better teachable moment than when I go in and ask the code official for a permit. I'm asking for a permit, and they have a checklist that says, I need to see your certificate from a certified renovator. You've got a wonderful check at the teachable moment. So the goal is to, pro to pro improve the compliance, not through enforcement, but by reaching people at that teachable moment. Tom, we got several questions here regarding money, and uh, it, it's coming from both the question of how would a homeowner address this from the money. The other question is, would this be applicable um, uh, from an insurance side to say, this is health in your house? Can should we shouldn't this be covered by insurance in, in some manner, or is the um, uh, uh, would a provision within a state, uh, uh, a person's homeowner's policy, there was a question there about a homeowner's policy, would that cover this in, in any case, in any manner? Those, those are great questions, and I, I really don't have firm answers to it, because a lot of that is still in the exploratory area. We do know that when you get a federal, a federal a federally insured mortgage, they check for some things on the home. Uh, they tend to look for things that are show the home is falling apart versus unhealthy. Yet we know that if residents are unhealthy, they're going to have a hard time paying the mortgage. We also have a program, uh, Amanda Reddy in our shop at the National Center for Healthy Housing is sort of leading an effort with many states that are on this on asthma that is saying housing is really a form of health care that if you if there are if you don't never if healthcare is only going to your doctor's office and you never ask are there cockroaches all over the home or is there carbon monoxide that's causing you not to be to be so befuddled in the morning that if you don't deal with those issues you may be missing the point so it's looking at saying starting with lead poisoning or with children with lead uh, elevated blood blood levels or um, asthma. Uh, children or adults with asthma, saying, what can we do in the home to make sure that we clean up those triggers, that we deal with those lead hazards? There's already federal funding through the Medicare, uh, Medicaid program for lead, where there is a push, and many states are doing it for asthma, because it's been very clear that if you do effective pest control, integrated pest management, and you do cleaning up the messes that are left behind, you can do a lot to protect an asthmatic, and those costs are much, much, much smaller than an emergency room visit, smaller than even some of the medic medications that the person has to take. So we do see health care insurance playing a role. I, I, we haven't really thought about the property owner's insurance, but clearly the health of the resident is important and the health of guests is important. So I think that's something where we work with those 50 laboratories and see how to make it happen. Um, Tom, could you speak more about the impact that a healthy housing standard may have on neighborhood stabilization and uh, educational impacts? Um, wow, um, that's a broad one. Um, I, I, we haven't looked at that closely, but clearly if you've got a healthy home, you're going to have a more stable neighborhood. Um, you're not going to have people rotating in and out of houses. We all know the progression that you see in houses from owner-occupied, single-family homes, owner-occupied, to then rental, to then subsidized rental, where HUD money is often having to manage the property that isn't qualifying for market rate rental. So it's important to use healthy homes so so housing stays healthy and doesn't slide down that scale where eventually it's now one where we're asking whether it should be demolished because it's so far gone. So the idea is, like property maintenance, to keep the homes healthy. And if a home is healthy, the kids are going to be going to school. They're not going to be struggling with the asthma trap that keeps the parents out of work and the kids out of school. So I think a healthy home can go a long way to helping stabilize a community. And also, if you have those homes falling apart, if you have the vacant homes, 
you clearly have a neighborhood that's falling into disrepair faster. So trying to keep the homes occupied and moving them up the ladder towards health is a critical way to, to make neighborhoods more stable and livable. Um, Tom, we have time for about one more question. And, um, and, and I apologize for the folks we did not get to, but we'll try to get to you uh, in, in the next few weeks here. But um, one more question it comes to the, uh, relates with HUD. Will HUD adopt this as their policy, or will this be something that's going to be a national center policy, or will this come out of the ICC? How is this going to be promoted? Well, it is uh, a joint effort of the National Center for Healthy Housing and the American Public Health Association. Those are the owners of the document. And Centers for Disease Control was very helpful in making that happen, and we very much appreciate their Healthy Homes program. Um, without it, I, you know, they're working on lead poisoning prevention and healthy homes and making a big difference. Um, we don't, I, would, I don't think HUD would, could or would adopt the standards as it is. They have to put it into their program and weave it in. So I think what it is is that a la carte menu to look for adoption. Um, we do, just as we look at that for the, uh, the green standards, the LEED standard, the uh, neighbor work standard, the enterprise green standard. So I think it's going to be used as a menu of options. We're going to keep it updated. Uh, we'd always like people who adopt it to give us credit and to talk about it. Um, and we want to help them make that happen. But it's important to think of it as an a la carte menu where you pick the items that are critical to your community or your program. So this won't be a, a document that's owned by HUD or CDC. It's going to be something that they will reference, um, but it won't be uh, something that they can put their name on? Um, we're not going to stop anybody from putting their name on it. And we are thinking if the more they could adopt of it, the better off I think the health of Americans would be. Um, we just like attribution, but um, we're, we're flexible. The, our bottom line is it, the goal is to get it used. I don't really care who gets credit for it. I just want to make sure it gets used because these are the things that the science has shown, shown them are affordable and effective, and that's the ultimate goal. Okay, well with that, I'm going to extend a great thank you to Tom Neltner and also to HUD's Office of Lead-Based Pain and Healthy Housing for their support today of this webinar. Again, this is Doug Farquhar, and on behalf of NCSL, I want to say thank you, and uh, thank you for the attendees for logging on for today. As a reminder, this recording is being has been recorded and is going to be available uh, along with the presentation slides on the NCSL website. You should re be receiving an email shortly on how to access those resources. If you do not receive that email or any information by the mid part of next week, please feel free to send me an email. Um, my email address should be on the screen, but if you can, do not see it, uh, it would be Doug. Dot Farquhar, F A R Q U H A R, at ncsl.org. And I'll be uh, glad to forward that information to review the uh, webinar uh, to you directly. With that, I want to say thank you and have a very pleasant weekend. Thank you, Doug, and thank you all for taking time out of your Friday to participate.